people. Easter people. And today we're going to talk about the show on the road. The show on the road. Because we've been talking about those lives that have been affected by the resurrection of Jesus. Remember, we, we talked about Mary Magdalene, who was the first to have see Jesus after he had risen. We talked about the effect of Jesus entering that locked room with the disciples there. And uh, as we heard in the scriptures that were through the video, Thomas was not with them. But we talked about doubting Thomas, right? But we found out that he's also Thomas the Brave. We found out that we are not labeled and uh, that we might be labeled with the labels of God that we're going to talk about in the weeks to come. We also talked about Good Friday. And, and uh, we also talked about Joseph of Arimathea and how the resurrection of Christ, the crucifixion and resurrection, how it affected them. And you can listen to those, of course, on our website. And you can listen to them on our Facebook page. But as we see from the scriptures that we saw in the video, the stone is rolled away. Jesus' grave clothes are left there in the tomb. And even the cloth that was on Jesus' face is neatly folded and place there. Now we have to realize that the tomb was not opened for Jesus to get out. I mean, <laughs> it was opened by the angel to let people come in. And as they said, see, he is not here, he is risen. Because that was their first question who is going to roll the stone away for us? And the Romans were there guarding. The entrance of the tomb that no one would come and steal the body of Jesus and say that he had raised from the dead. But of course, we know that he had already risen from the dead. He did not need to get out of the tomb. He had already he was already gone. He had just as he came to the disciples in the in the, the locked room, he. He just. Was out and threw whatever. Physical limits there were was nothing for him to go through. Remember that the soldiers, as the angel came, it says that they were so afraid, that they were so amazed at the glory and the splendor. It says that they were really on the ground and they were, we could say, stupefied <laughs> at the presence of the glory of just of the angels who had been with God. So, as we've talked about in the series, we talked about Easter people. And we began with saying that this is a display. This is the greatest show on earth. We could say that the resurrection of Christ is the greatest show in the universe, in all creation, all that there is. It's the greatest show that you'll ever know. And you'll ever see. And we say that as, of course, the circus with the three ring circus, you know, uh, Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey. And they say they were the greatest show on earth. And, and so, the, so what we're talking about is it's not just a show, but it's a display of Jesus rising from the dead, proving that the sins that had limited us and separated us from God were dealt with on the cross. And his death, and his burial, now his resurrection means that we were forgiven and raised with him. This is the greatest spectacle, the greatest public showing of the power of God. The scriptures even say that Jesus, when he was in the grave for three days, went down to the Hades, the place of the dead. And it says that he triumphed over all the powers and authorities. He disarmed them and he made a public show, a spectacle of them triumphing over them in the cross. We could say it was the death of death. 
we can say now that the show must go on and the show must go on the road. We're going to read from Luke chapter 24. And if you've got your, your notes there, if you watch it up on the screen, we see that uh, it's a long scripture. I don't usually do a long scripture, but I think that it, it's needed because I think this is a story maybe you don't think of or you don't maybe re even remember reading in Luke chapter 24. We're going to be begin with verse 13. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Amos, about seven miles from Jerusalem. As they talked and discussed these things, this is Resurrection Day, and they're talking about uh, the death and burial of Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus was raised yet. And it says, and they, and they discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. The chief priests and our rulers, so Jesus appears to them. He's walking with them. They don't recognize him. And, and uh, he says, you know, what's going on? What are you guys talking about? And verse 20 says, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So, so they get to, as we, before we get to verse 30, as they are walking along the road, they get to the city that their home is at. And Jesus is acting like he's going to keep going. And they invite him, say, it's late, it's almost evening, come in and eat with us. And Jesus agreed to do this. And see, they still didn't recognize that it was Jesus, the resurrected Lord. And so in verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Think about that. There he is. He disappears. They just realized it was him. It's like, now you leave? Thanks. I mean, but at least they recognized him. <laughs> and then he disappeared. Verse 32 says, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, we talked, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And then verse 33 says, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together. So the greatest show of Easter, the power goes on the road. <laughs> and it goes on the road to meet us where we are. Aren't you glad that that message, that the resurrected Lord took it out on the road, went with those who were walking away from Jerusalem, and we know, of course, the gospel message, the greatest show on earth, went all over the world and is here today. See, these, these two men weren't in Jerusalem, but in Amos and amazed there. They didn't have to be in Jerusalem to be amazed, but they were in their hometown. And I want you to know you can be amazed here in River Falls here in Wisconsin, and all over the world. Now, you get the picture that as they walked along the road, they were talking about what had happened to the one they believed was the Messiah. They were so sad. They were so stricken with what had happened. Their dreams had been dashed. Think about maybe what we have gone through in this world over the last few years. Many dreams have been dashed due to COVID and due to all the things that have happened. And we think finally we're getting over it. Finally we're getting through that. Many people's businesses and jobs through all of the things that are trying to deal with this 
many were out of work, lost their businesses and things like that. But we think, okay, now it's turning. We're going to be able to go further. And now we see inflation <laughs> hitting us so hard after 40 years. It's the, the worst we've ever seen. What do we do? How are we going to make it? Sometimes our dreams can be derailed by the circumstances, the situation that's in the world, and we all know it's difficult sometimes to keep going forward. So this is where these two men were at. Their dreams had been destroyed. They were dashed, and uh, they were fearful of what's going to happen next because all the followers were wondering if they were going to be coming after them now. But see, Jesus came to them not to change the reality of the situation, but to show a different perspective. He says, yes, these are the facts. Yes, these are the things. But I want you to know what the Bible says, that these things must happen. So Jesus says the circumstances you face aren't nearly as important as the, con as the conclusions that you draw. The circumstances you face aren't nearly as important as the, con the con con conclusions you draw. See, Jesus challenged their conclusions. But you notice he did this first. He walked with them at first and listened to them. And then he spoke to them. See, Jesus models for us how to minister to someone who's grieving after a loss. I mean, this is the worst news, the worst situation. They had seen their Lord. They had seen their Savior. They had seen the Messiah crucified on a cross after being amazed by his miracles, after following him for years, after seeing uh, the incredible effect of his words upon people. And their hopes had been dashed. Even in the scripture we read, it said, We had hoped. <laughs> We had hoped. In other words, we don't hope now. It was something that we had hoped before. They thought their best days were behind them. But he tells them that their conclusions were incorrect. Aren't you glad that sometimes we need to be corrected? By the Bible, by the Word of God, by Jesus himself. He says, you know what, your conclusions about what happened are wrong. They thought that, well, the body of Jesus must have been stolen. Someone must have taken him because, you know, these, this idle tale, this tall tale that the women had, that they saw angels and they said that he had risen. You know, this just can't be, be what happened. But see, a lot of times when we deal with difficult painful things in our lives, we realize that maybe we're coming to some wrong conclusions. And we need to hear what the truth is. And the truth is the Word of God is our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe there's someone here, maybe you're using the past tense about your life, about different things, you know. That business was. It's not now. It was. Maybe you're saying, you know what, my dream was this or that. I was living the best time of my life, but I can't believe that this has happened. But you know what, Jesus says your best days are yet to come. Your best days are on the way. Because he takes the greatest show on the road wherever you are. So when you're dealing with difficult, painful things, realize you may come to wrong conclusions. Charles Swindoll said this, he says, Life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. I think that is something that we all should remember. Life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. Usually we put it the other way, right? <laughs> Usually we think, oh, you know, 90% of what happened to me, woe is me, look what's happened to me, everyone's against me, life is against me, everything has aligned itself against me. 
and then I only have this little bit of power to correct it. But no, with Jesus Christ, you can control how you respond. We cannot control what others do. We cannot control what others say. We cannot control their faith or lack thereof in the things of God. But you can control how you respond, and that should be how we always triumph in Christ Jesus. We can still choose to respond with faith in God. We can choose choose to respond in our worship to God. We see that these two men had potential that was unlocked by a new perspective. They felt that very hour, or they left that very hour, it says in the scripture, when they realized it was Jesus. Remember, it was evening. They did not have street lights. You know, it was not a lighted path. They tried to get off the streets at, at dark, off the roads, off the paths because of robbers and so forth. But yet, they said they left immediately and they went back to Jerusalem for they had just come to see the disciples and tell them, we have seen the Lord. He is risen from the dead. They were so excited. They did not, did not matter that they were going back in the dark hope gives you light gives you wings enables you to go when you would never go before see don't use the past tense because jesus is alive and he has something good in store for you so there's a wrong way sometimes to read the bible there's a right way there's a wrong way Remember, it says that they, they said, we thought Jesus was going to redeem Israel. See, they had the understanding that the Messiah would come, set up a new kingdom on earth, and that Jesus was the one. And they're like, too bad he died. <laughs> See, they ignored the whole Old Testament scriptures pointing to a Messiah who would redeem Israel by dying. But they thought that Jesus was on a political campaign they wanted to see the crown, but not the cross. They wanted to see him on the throne without him ever having to wear that crown of thorns. He had to go to the cross in order for him to wear that crown as the King of kings and Lord of lords. So when we look at the Bible, sometimes we look at it, and we have to realize we have to look at the Bible for what Jesus promised to us. It's not about what we can do, that we can do the Bible. It's what does the Bible do in and forth through Jesus for us. What did Jesus promise? Jesus fulfilled prophecies that began even from the very Garden of Eden, just after the first sin, that he would be coming. So now the works that we do flow out of him, because... Having healed us, we're able to bring that same healing, that same resurrection life to others. See, the death, burial, and resurrection is what we needed and what the world needs today. Dying on the cross, paid for our sins, rising from the dead, secured us in the Holy Spirit, and we're able to tap into that power and live that life every day. The Bible says... Several times, know ye not, ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't you know the Holy Spirit lives in you? <laughs> That's what he's telling us because of what Jesus has done. So see, we are the Easter people. You're an Easter people. I'm an Easter people. Easter isn't a holiday, it's an identity. It's an everyday reality. We have been filled with the Spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead. That same power, raised Him from the dead, dwells in us when we say, Yes, Jesus, I accept what you've done. We say, Yes, Jesus, you're my Lord. You're my Savior. I put my faith and trust in you alone. It's not by works that we're saved, but by faith in what Jesus has done and promised us. Easter occurred on the first day of the week. Think about that. 
I think he was explaining through that act that the original week of creation was done and something new was beginning. Because under the first Adam's headship, you know, Adam in the garden, there was sin, there was death, there was the curse. And so the perfect Garden of Eden, the perfect world was destroyed before it hardly began. But the second Adam in the garden chose not he says, not my will, but your will be done. And he yielded to what he was sent to do. And he willingly went to the cross. You know, when I grew up, we'd sing that old hymn, you know. He could have called 10,000 angels. But he chose to die for you and for me. He could have called down those angels to take him off of that cross. And guess what? Those um, beside him... the those who were hanging on the cross beside him, those thieves were saying, hey, if you're the Messiah, come down off the cross and goading him on. But he paid the price. He went all the way. He says, it is finished on the cross. You know, he's, he said that he's going to come again and he's going to take us all home to be with him. And there's going to be a new world why doesn't he do it sooner? <laughs> Today would be good. <laughs> I'll sign up for that. <laughs> he could come now. I mean, with the war and Ukraine and all the things going on in the world, I mean, the death and destruction, it seems like, where's God? If he's alive, why doesn't he stop this? Why doesn't he come? But you know what? I'm glad he waited long enough to allow me to come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. He says he has long patience for the precious fruit of the earth. You're that fruit. You're that precious thing that he's given all for. He's given his life for. He suffered and died for. It's you, and he's waiting for all of us to come to say yes to Jesus. Yes to receiving the resurrection life and eternal life. John 16, 22 says, you, so you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy. No matter what we're facing, the storms of life, the difficulties that may come, Jesus says you will have trouble in this world, but he says, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. We have a new perspective, a new way of looking at things. We filter it not through the trials and tribulations, but through the victory of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and by his word that lives and dwells in our hearts. Because we may have sorrow, but he will, we will see him again and we will rejoice and no one can rob you of this joy. I remember working at United Parcel Service as a college student working in those hot trucks and all those dusty boxes and loading them for four or five hours in the night. And people would complain and people would, you know, talk about all their troubles and everything. And finally somebody came up to me and says, you never complain about anything. <laughs> Why is that? So well, it's not me, it's Jesus in me. It's Jesus in me that allows me to have a new perspective, a new way of looking at the world and, and life because I've got life more abundant. I've got the joy that the world cannot rob me of. So as Jesus is given back to you in the resurrection and the Holy Spirit has been given, we are able to walk in joy, a joy that the world can't take away. It says in John 20, verse 20, it says, As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. It didn't matter what the terrible suffering that they had endured to see what happened to Jesus and their loss of hope, but now it was restored. They're filled with joy. When was it that the two on the road realized that it was Jesus? When was it? It was when he was breaking the bread, blessed it, and gave it to them. Just like that had happened on the Lord's Supper. He broke it, he blessed it. 
Just like when he was before all the people and fed them. And the miracle of feeding all those thousands of people. He broke it and blessed it and it multiplied. See, he is the bread of life. He says, I am the bread. I am broken for you. And then that brokenness was blessed. Jesus dying on the cross, he was broken so that we might be blessed. The greater the suffering, the greater the glory. He was broken to bless us. The greater the pain, the bigger the power. It's the greatest display of God's power. He that was dead, he that knew no sin, became sin. He would die on a cross for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. See, we can realize we've gained everything in Christ. So we can walk in that joy that will never be taken away. Jesus, who couldn't be held back by death itself, waited to be welcomed into those two on the road, be welcomed into their home. He he stands today at the door of your heart, at the home uh, that you live, wishing you would welcome him in. 1 Peter 1 and verse 8 and 9 says, You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. That is the reward as we trust in him. He sends the Holy Spirit to live in us. We become new creations in Christ. The old has passed away. All things become new. And we begin a process of renewing our minds to the truth of that which has, we have experienced. We have a desire to walk and live with him. Because he's loved us. He's put a new spirit within us. And because of that, we live for him every day. It's an invitation to a life of joy. Yes, there might be troubles, there might be pains, that we might be things that we have to overcome, but with Him we are overcomers in this life. We will thrive no matter what the world throws at us. <laughs> we will overcome no matter what happens, because we have His Spirit who leads and guides us. We have the Word of God that we can put our trust and faith in. I want you to know we are the Easter people. I'm going to lead us all in a prayer here today on this Easter Sunday. And as you put your faith and trust in Him, as you pray this prayer with me, know that He has come to give you life. He has not come to condemn you. He's come to save you. And when we put our trust in what Jesus has done and believe that He died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried, and on the third day he arose. He arose so that you might live, and that you're seated with him in the heavenlies. Will you put your faith in him if we will confess him, and believe in our hearts that he has risen from the dead? We will be saved. So repeat this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I put my trust in Jesus Christ. He died for my sins. He was buried, and on the third day, He arose. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Holy Spirit, come and live in me. Make me new. Thank you for saving me. I am born again. Jesus, I choose to follow you. I say yes to Jesus. Amen. Amen.